In this video, we share 21 takeaways from Atomic Habits and how we've taken the content from this book and applied it to our life. Hi, I'm Shelby. Thanks for watching this video. Now let's hop into the takeaways. Takeaway number one, habits are like trees. Breaking a bad habit is like uprooting a large oak tree. And creating a good habit is like cultivating a small little sapling. It's going to take time to rewire your brain and uproot old thoughts or behaviors that you've been cultivating. What are some bad habits that you need to uproot in your life? What are some good habits that need to be planted and nurtured? Takeaway number two, goals are overrated. Goals can be helpful, but they don't hold a candle to creating a lifestyle system. Goals are binary. You either obtain the goal or you don't. You either ran the marathon or you didn't. You either lost 50 pounds or you didn't. You either made $100,000 or you didn't. When you set measurable goals, you are boxing yourself into a very narrow view of success and not allowing yourself to be flexible. Goals can become harmful if you achieve them. For example, if you do a Whole30 and you achieve it, what happens on day 31? If your goal was to run a marathon and you accomplish that, what's the point of running anymore? This is why people often fall into bad habits after accomplishing a goal. I want you to try to determine what the true goal is. If you wanna run a marathon, perhaps the true goal there is to become a healthy person. You wanna make $100,000, perhaps you actually want to become financially stable you want to lose 40 pounds, maybe you just want to be confident in your body. Here's a question to ask yourself. What is the true desire at the root of your goal? Once you know what your goal is, you can find that desire and see what you're actually searching for. Takeaway number three, identity is greater than the habits. Habits are all about identity. Marathon runners show up every day because they view themselves as runners. Wealthy people invest in the stock market because they view themselves as investors. Songwriters create music because they view themselves as musicians. It's your identity that allows you to confront the inevitable challenges that arise when mastering something. Vegans are far more consistent in their diet than those on keto, paleo, or Whole30. Is that because a vegan diet is easier? Of course not. It's because they have created an identity for themselves. They are simply vegan. One exercise from the book is to simply ask yourself if your desired identity lines up with your actions. For example, if you go to the refrigerator and you see cake, you ask yourself, would a healthy person eat this? It's easier to change a habit if you try to emulate someone else. I like to take it one step further and actually give my ideal person a name. Perhaps I'm running into a problem with self-confidence and courage. I may ask myself, what would Jessica Day do in this situation? Here's a great one. What would Taylor Swift do if someone was critical about her music? She would shake it off, shake it off. The goal is to view yourself as the kind of person who performs the desired action. I'm the kind of parent who is patient under pressure. I'm the kind of partner who listens before responding. I'm the kind of boss who cares for the emotional needs of my employees over business results. Change your identity and your outcomes will automatically change. What type of person do you want to embody? Who are the specific people you want to emulate in key areas of your life? Find someone for fitness, business, faith, or maybe someone who you admire their confidence. Takeaway number four. The goal is not perfection, but it's to win the election. If you have an all or nothing view of identity, you may find yourself quitting good habits often. However, this is not how identity works. If a kind person is rude to their spouse, does that automatically make them an unkind person? If a good salesperson loses a sale, does that make her a bad salesperson? If a healthy person eats a piece of cake, do they automatically become an unhealthy person? Of course not. Instead, it's helpful to think of habits as an election. Each time you do a good habit or action, you are casting a vote for the type of person you want to become. Each time you do something undesirable, you are casting a vote in the opposite box. Your goal isn't to be perfect with your identity, but it's to win the majority. Takeaway number five, habits help solve problems. Humans love to solve problems. Problem solving is all about weighing the pros and cons of a situation and creating a plan of action. This takes brain power. To free up space to solve problems, your brain creates habits to automatically address reoccurring problems in your life. This is how the problem of I'm sleepy can result in an automatic response of get coffee. Soon your body will fix the problem without you having to think about it. 
Every morning when you feel tired, you just grab a cup of joe. What are the reoccurring problems in your life? Takeaway number six, habit stacking. One of the easiest ways to create a good habit is to use a technique called habit stacking. Habit stacking is essentially a sequence of helpful habits that happen one after another. Morning routines are great examples of habit stacks. You probably have a morning routine that looks something like you wake up, take a shower, get dressed, make some coffee, and then maybe you walk your dog. If you already have this consistency, adding an additional helpful habit to the sequence is super easy. For example, if you desire to meditate every day, you can just start implementing it into your current habit stack, perhaps after you walk your dog or after you get ready in the morning. In a way, this creates a lifestyle train, which is really difficult to break. It's easy to add more cars to a train that is already rolling. We mentioned this concept in our work from home tips tutorial. You can find the link to that below. I recently have it stacked my daily vitamins into my morning routine. I've created a habit of adding collagen to my coffee every morning. And now when I open the cabinet to grab my protein, my gummy vitamins are staring right at me. It can also be easy to have a train of bad habit stacks. Examine your routine. Perhaps you want to stop scrolling through social media when you want to be outlining an article instead. What's triggering that habit? Is it stacked with going to the restroom, take your phone with you, scroll through social media, and all of a sudden it's been an hour and a half and you're still not writing? Can you unstack that habit? Yes. Perhaps next time you go to the restroom, don't take your phone with you when you gotta go. Takeaway number seven, habit trackers. Another helpful tool for keeping a habit is a habit tracker. There are many ways to measure your habits, including journals and apps. Use whatever system is easiest for you. Here's a good rule of thumb that James Clear mentions in the book. Allow life to happen. Missing one day of a habit is totally fine, but try as much as possible to not miss two days in a row. Remember, we're cultivating a tiny new sapling. We want to make sure this habit has the opportunity to take root. In the description of this video, you can find more resources for tracking your habits. Takeaway number eight, beware of immediate pleasures. Here's a good rule of thumb. Good habits have net positive results. Bad habits have net negative. Just because a habit has an initially positive result doesn't mean it will be helpful for you in the long run. Smoking may initially give you the social connection with those you care about, but in the long run, this will destroy your health. Social media in the morning may allow you to connect with friends, but in the long run, you'll put off writing that book you desire to publish. 19th century French economist Frédéric Bastiat says, it almost always happens that when the immediate consequence is favorable, the later consequence is disastrous and vice versa. If you continued your current lifestyle for 30 years, where would you be? What habits of instant gratification are keeping you from thriving in the long run? Takeaway number nine, be predictable. Habits like people thrive in predictable circumstances. In a world of pop stars and novelty, it can be easy to look at consistency as a negative thing. However, it's often the person who creates a predictable, repeatable lifestyle that sees the most growth. Here's a zinger of a quote. There is nothing more boring than the person who does everything while becoming nothing. Don't be afraid to be boring. Takeaway number 10, temptation bundling. One of the easiest ways to create a good habit is to use a system called temptation bundling. Temptation bundling is the process of pairing short-term and long-term gratifications together. If you want to read 50 books in a year and you often get distracted by TV and drinking wine, you can tell yourself, I will only drink wine while reading a book. If you want to run more, tell yourself, I'll only watch my favorite TV show if I'm also running on a treadmill. Here's a pro tip, taxes and whiskey, we don't recommend. How can you pair your favorite short-term gratifications with long-term desires? Takeaway number 11, your environment shapes your success. Your physical environment shapes the success of your habit. In the book, Clear talks about Hungarian psychologist Laszlo Polgar. Laszlo believed he could use an idealized home environment to raise his children to become great chess players. Before his first child was born, he designed his entire house to complement chess. He placed posters of famous chess players on the walls, he scattered chess boards around the house, and for fun, his family would simply play chess. His three daughters were raised in this environment. By the time the youngest was 14, she was a chess world champion. Over time, two of the daughters would go on to become the first and second best female chess players in the world. Such a lifestyle sounds perhaps oppressive or mean to the average person, but for the Polgar family, it was quite the opposite. The daughters talked about how they loved their home life growing up. Chess was all they knew and their controlled lifestyle led to mastery of their pursuit. Your habits can benefit from a similar lifestyle design. 
shape your home because it will shape you. What changes can you make today in your home environment to cultivate better habits? Takeaway number 12, your friends shape your success. The people around you literally shape who you are. In the book of Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20 says, if you want to grow in wisdom, spend time with the wise. Walk with the wicked and you'll eventually become just like them. You are the average of the five closest people in your life. The goal is to join a culture where your desired behavior is normal behavior. You will have a much harder time becoming a runner if none of your friends value running. Hang out with entrepreneurs and you may find yourself more successful in growing your own business. Find a group of like-minded folks who identify with your ideal self. For example, if you want to become a better artist, find people who identify as artists. The shared identity will reinforce your personal identity. Here are some questions for reflection. Do the people around you reinforce your desired self-identity? What in-person or online groups can you join to help encourage your ideal lifestyle? Takeaway number 13, quantity over quality. We've been trained by clever storytellers to believe that quality is more important than quantity. This is not true. Quality is a byproduct of quantity. Let's explore this. Clear shares a story of a college photography professor. The professor decided to divide his students into two groups, the quality group and the quantity group. One group would be graded by the quantity of photographs taken. The more photographs taken, the better the grade. The other group would be graded on quality of photos. Anything less than great was penalized. At the end of the semester, the professor reviewed the photos taken by the class and was amazed to see that the best photos came from the quantity group, not the quality group. The same is true for you. Instead of getting caught up on creating something perfect, focus on slight improvements over time. A 1% improvement every day for a year will yield 37 times the initial result. Math is awesome. You just have to show up that 1% each day. And what areas of your life are you focusing too heavily on quality instead of quantity? How can you create or do something poorly today with the hope of getting better in the future? Takeaway number 14, preparation can be a form of procrastination. We all know that watching TV, browsing social media, and playing video games can be a way to avoid work. However, if you're watching this video, there's a good chance you already know that. For self-motivated people, procrastination often comes in the form of things that feel productive, but these things can actually be time wasters. Oftentimes, I find myself using organization as a way to buffer when I'm actually wanting to get a task done. My common buffers or procrastinations look like this. Checking emails, organizing folders, maybe I'm continuing to manage my project board, scheduling meetings, taking courses, or even starting a new book. That's not to say any of these things are bad. They can all be good, but they are often procrastination tactics used to avoid actually doing something. Maybe you've seen this in your own work. Instead of acting as a helpful communication session, meetings turn into productivity time wasters. In fact, there's often a backwards relationship between the number of meetings someone has and the productivity of themselves and their team. A well-tuned writer could create an article in about three hours. A poor meeting, however, can take the same amount of time. Action often creates enthusiasm. Start on the thing you find yourself resisting despite how you're feeling in the moment. The inspiration, courage, and enthusiasm will typically follow. What productive thing in your life is actually a source of procrastination? What are your secret time wasters? Takeaway number 15, professionals keep going. Simply put, when successful people get knocked down, they get back up. Oftentimes, folks get caught up in the belief that if you can't do something perfectly, you shouldn't do it at all. The truth is, failure is going to happen. In fact, it must happen to be successful. To be afraid of failure is to deny success. How has your fear of failure kept you from starting a good habit? How can you celebrate your failures this week? Perhaps open a note on your phone and start keeping a record of your failures. Celebrate them. These failures help move you towards success. Takeaway number 16, target identities, not numbers. Humans love number-based goals. We want to hit 10,000 steps, lose 40 pounds, save $50,000, gain 10,000 followers. Just because something can be measured doesn't mean it's actually helpful for your lifestyle. My favorite example of this is a diet Caleb went on a few years ago. He told himself he wasn't gonna eat fried food for 30 days, period. Seems harmless, right? The problem was, instead of making the goal to be someone who was healthy, he fell in love with the challenge of not eating fried food. He went to this burger place with some coworkers and he ordered a burger. And instead of getting the typical fries on the side, he ordered a side of chili dog. This is hilarious. Sure, he met the goal, 
but was actually hurting his ultimate goal of becoming a healthier person. He held too tightly to this measured goal of not eating fried food instead of looking at the larger picture. Despite what your boss may tell you, when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to become a good measure. Like we discussed in takeaway two, think about the root of the goal. What are you actually wanting? What unhelpful measurements of success should you rethink? What is the real motivation behind your number-based goals? Takeaway number 17, what annoying process do you love? Everybody loves something that others find boring. In fact, it's often your ability to fall in love with a boring process that makes you find more success in the long run. If you fall in love with reading old history textbooks, you may have a great shot at becoming a successful historian. If you love meal planning, you would likely become a great nutritionist. If you love numbers and spreadsheets, you might make a prolific accountant. We think rock stars have it easy, but if you're not in love with sleepless nights and financial insecurity, perhaps that's not the role for you. There are things in your life that feel natural. These things come with great difficulty to other people. Those things are your strengths. What boring things do you enjoy? What painful processes do you enjoy that others typically complain about? Takeaway number 18, creating superpowers, the power of combination. You will probably never become world-class in any industry. Despite your love of a hobby or subject, you probably won't be the world's best writer, athlete, painter, or business owner, but that's okay. Great things happen when you combine two things you're pretty good at instead of trying to be world-class at any single thing. I'm pretty decent at curation and I really enjoy studying mental health. Therefore, perhaps I can take those two things and eventually create a superpower. Combining two things that you're pretty good at is like playing a game that you've created. Other people can try to play along but ultimately it'll become too difficult or too expensive for them to compete. You will always win when you create a new category. Play a game where it's better to be you. Here's a quick exercise. Step one, make a list of things you're pretty good at. Step two, combine some of those things together. These combinations are the things that will bring you success, wealth, and fame in the long run. Takeaway number 19, 4% flows. The desire for any productive individual is to enter into a work zone called a flow state. If you watch the movie Soul, you know exactly what I'm referring to. A flow state is a mindset where you're incredibly productive and tuned in to the work you are doing. These flow states happen in a very controlled and regulated environment. They will never happen with Slack and social notifications pinging you nonstop. To enter this flow state, you must follow a simple principle. Create a distraction-free environment and push yourself 4% more than you did last time. By pushing yourself slightly, but not too much, you give your brain the right amount of challenge and comfort to grow without burnout or boredom. How can you remove distractions so that you can work in a flow state? Takeaway number 20, mastery leads to complacency. It's the age old story. A boxing legend is defeated by the young champion. A world-class painter is upstaged by a high school prodigy. The Instagrammer makes more money than the business tycoon. We can't help but call this the blockbuster effect. It's easy to assume that because you're the master or a successful person, you don't need to change or grow. But after a while, your mastery of a subject becomes a liability. Every accomplishment will be upstaged. Every record will be broken. Every dominant business will become an underdog. Every industry will change. Mark Zuckerberg himself knows this fact. He said, if we don't create the thing that will kill Facebook, someone else will. The trick is to become the type of person who is willing to become better. Be the type of person who continually grows and changes. Press into innovation and change. If not, you may soon fall behind. What mastered skill of yours may be in need of a refresh? What new technologies could potentially destroy your current industry? And for our final takeaway, number 21, establish a system for reflection and review. Creating a good habit is an awesome accomplishment. It is vital for you to have a system to review your accomplishments and reorient your habit systems. For example, is the keto diet actually helping you lose weight? Does running actually make you feel healthier? Are your work habits truly leading to the results you want? By setting aside regular time to review your performance, you can discern if your lifestyle needs any changes. At Curious Refuge, we like to use Michael Hyatt's life score assessment tool every quarter. We recommend using this tool. How will you begin to consistently review your habits? I hope you've enjoyed these takeaways. Leave a comment. Let us know which takeaway resonated with you the most. Best of luck in cultivating and stacking some new habits this week. We'll see you next time. Cheers.